Hello, and welcome to the sermons of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Fort Capel, Saskatchewan. I'm Pastor Joshua Kirkovac. Today is Septuagesima, and our Gospel reading comes from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, Go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour. You have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. This is the word of the Lord. Our sermon was recorded previously at our our divine service. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. With this, our Lord opens his parable, meant to illustrate that the first will be last and the last first. In it, we see the master of the house a land-owning man with a large enough estate to have a sizable vineyard and a steward to go out into the marketplace multiple times a day to hire workers for his vineyard. When he first goes out early in the morning, he agrees with some laborers to pay them a single denarius for their day's work. He continues to go out to hire more at nine, noon, and three according to our reckoning of time, but doesn't tell them how much he will pay them other than saying, whatever is right, I will give you. Finally, around five o'clock, just an hour before the end of the workday, he finds the stragglers, those who haven't been hired all day, those who would end up going back to their families with no money if no one were to hire them, and says to them, you go into the vineyard also. When the end of the work day came, the householder and owner of the vineyard called to his steward and said, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. It was the practice in those days, due to the law of God, that a worker would be paid for the work that he did on the day that he did it. As it says in Deuteronomy 24, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are with you in the land in your towns, you shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. And so while paying them all at the end of the day was the usual practice, paying the last first and the first last was unusual. In fact, it was the opposite of what everyone would have expected. And so the foreman paid those who were idle and unemployed all the day, each a denarius. When they saw this, those hired first became excited, thinking, these ones have barely worked, and they got a whole denarius. How much more will we get? We've worked hard all day, worked in the scorching heat when the sun was at its height. We've worked more. We are certainly better. Surely we deserve more than they got. How they were disappointed when they also received a denarius each. 
They grumbled against the householder and said, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat, the burden of the day, and the scorching heat. Their grumbling does not go unnoticed by the owner, and he speaks with one for all. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? With this, the parable ends as our Lord tells us, so the last will be first and the first last. Based on what was said, we can see that the first workers leave the vineyard with their wages, while the rest stay and enjoy the vineyard owner's generosity and hospitality. And so this morning, we will be focusing on two themes. First, on the graciousness of God, and second, on the true doctrine of good works. First, let us see how our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, presents the grace of God to us in this parable. To do so, we must first look at what parts of the parable point to other things, because not every little detail in a parable necessarily represents something else. But it's clear in this case that the master of the house, the one who owns a large estate and a vineyard to which he directs special attention and care, represents God. The vineyard then, which is his object of special care, is his kingdom. And so in this parable, to be in the kingdom of heaven is to be a worker in the vineyard. Notice how the master of the house finds workers for his vineyard. He has a foreman, a steward, someone who can look after his possessions, property, and laborers, but instead of sending him out to find workers, or instead of sending a messenger to put out a general announcement and waiting for workers to come to him, he goes out into the marketplace himself to find workers for his vineyard. And he doesn't just do this once at the beginning of the day and say, that's enough. Instead, he continues to go out multiple times to seek and find and call workers for his vineyard. He goes out even at the end of the day and looks for those to go out into his vineyard even though everyone else had passed them by because they were obviously not good workers. These two he finds and sends them into his vineyard. Just as no one can enter the vineyard to work without being brought in by the owner, so too no one can enter the kingdom of heaven without God first seeking them out and bringing them into the kingdom himself. No one enters the kingdom of heaven by their own seeking and finding it. No one strolls in uninvited. Instead, God must first, by his grace, call and gather one in. Our sins keep us from seeking out the kingdom. They cause all humanity to be idle in the marketplace of this world. And we would stay there until the short day of our life ends, if not for God in his grace, bringing us into his kingdom. Just as the owner went into the market to do this work himself in gathering workers, so too the Son of God became incarnate to do all that is necessary for our salvation, perfectly keeping the law and then giving his life as an offering to God bearing our sins on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. Now risen from the dead, he is not finished with his kingdom, but continues to work through the word and the sacraments to call, gather, and enlighten his people. All of us here and all Christians of all time have only been saved and brought into the kingdom through the work of God and his graciousness towards us. For through the word and through the sacraments, as through means, the Holy Spirit works to create saving faith, and so by this faith in Christ, we might be forgiven our sins and thus brought into the kingdom. So to observe the graciousness of God in this, that all the workers receive a denarius. 
The salvation which our God gives, he gives out of his own graciousness and generosity. It is his to do with what he pleases. It does not matter if one has been called to faith and in the Christian life from infancy or from childhood, as a young adult or as an adult or even in old age and the twilight of life. The salvation which our God gives is the same. All who are saved are saved by the free gift of his grace. This also is connected to the equal bliss which we will all enjoy in the heavenly kingdom, which has no end. Of course, our Lord and Savior has promised rewards to those who serve him in this life, saying, for example, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, each will receive his wages according to his labor. And of the righteous in the resurrection, the prophet Daniel says, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Thus we know there will be different rewards in heaven, but all have the same bliss. All enjoy the same salvation. Some will have a greater degree of glory, but all will have an equal salvation. For all have come to the same place because they received the salvation of the, for they received their salvation and forgiveness of sins won for them by the death of Jesus Christ, by God's grace through faith. As St. Paul says in Romans 5, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, eternal life comes equally to all who believe by God's grace. There will be no grumbling nor envy of others, as we shall all praise our God and Savior for his grace in saving us. And speaking of God's grace, just as those who were first hired grumbled when they saw that those who only worked an hour were paid the same as them, so too many today begrudge our Lord's generosity. Or to render the text more literally, their eye is evil because God is good. How often have you heard someone say something like this to you? Let me get this straight. You're saying that God forgives sins, wipes them all away by faith in Jesus, just by believing? Are you saying that the worst person in the whole world who could commit the most heinous crimes could repent on their deathbed and be saved after all what they have done? Count me out. That's just unfair. Here we see the scandal of the cross and how it is not our works which gain us heaven, but only faith. Only God's goodness and graciousness allow one to believe in Jesus and come to him and thus receive eternal life. It cannot be earned, and this upsets some, especially in our age where cancelling is prominent, where one public fault is enough to get rid of someone and banish them to the hell of irrelevance. But our Lord does not grant eternal life based on what we have done, but rather gives it as a gift to the one who receives the forgiveness of sins won on the cross for us by faith. Finally, since we have touched on this a little already, and since it is a part of our text, let us look at the true doctrine of good works. It cannot go unnoticed that the master of this house finds laborers to work in his vineyard. It is reminiscent of creation, where the Lord God made Adam and Eve to work in the garden. And just as the owner of the vineyard calls laborers to work for him, so too our Lord and Savior has saved us, has brought us into his kingdom, so that we may work. But let us always have that order correct, brothers and sisters. We are saved in order to do good works. We do not do good works in order to be saved. We must first be called from the idleness of sin into the vineyard of God before we may work. We do good works not to receive anything, 
not to merit salvation or justification, but that we might please him who has called us from sin and idleness to his kingdom of life and salvation. We are called to joyfully go about our work as those who are hired without any mention of what they would make other than what it is fair I will give you. Those laborers trusted in the goodness of the master of the house. They believed his promises and joyfully went about their work after being brought into the vineyard. Likewise, we who have been justified by grace through faith in Christ Jesus are to joyfully go about doing our good works, trusting in the promises of God for salvation for all who believe. Not because we're afraid of God and that he would punish us otherwise, not because we're attempting to earn our salvation by works, no, God forbid, but simply because this is what he has saved us to do, because he has called us that we may do so. For by grace you have been saved through faith, St. Paul writes to the Ephesians. And this is not your doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See again that order. We are saved by grace through faith in order to work. We are not saved by works. If we do good works in order to be saved or in order to merit our justification, we're seeking grounds for boasting. If we do good works with the attitude of those first laborers, that we want to earn something, earn our salvation, and want to say, I have done this, I have earned this, then we're deceiving ourselves. It leads to boasting, pride, and envy of God's graciousness. Hear the complaint of the first workers. You have made them equal to us. This is the inevitable result of attempting to merit salvation. It shifts the focus from oneself, shifts the focus to oneself and what we are doing. It seeks to get what we have earned. If it is earned, it is no longer a gift, but it is something that is owed. And God is a debtor to no one. If we demand of God that he gives to us what we deserve to give us the wages we have earned, he will indeed do that. And he will say, take what is yours and leave. Leave his presence. Leave his kingdom. For the wages of sin is death. And that is all that we can earn if we think that we can merit salvation. And so with the order clear, we set out to do the works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Because he has been so gracious to call us to himself, to bring us into his kingdom, we work for joy the good works which he has called us to do. We are to fear and love God above all, for he alone is all in all, ruler of all, and our Savior. We are to call upon him in prayer and praise with thanksgiving, and call upon him in every time of need. We are to pray for all people and for his kingdom. We are to gladly hear and learn his word, and attend the services of his house, giving as we are able for the maintenance of it, that the word of God may continue to be preached among us, and that we may be called, so that more may be called out of idleness and into the kingdom of God. We're to honor those in authority over us and pray for them. Parents, you're to raise your children in the faith. Grandparents, you are to help your children raise their children in godliness and encourage them in this good work. Children are to honor their parents and heed their instruction. We are to help our neighbor in every bodily need and all that is needed to support this life. All are to live chaste and decent lives, and husbands and wives are to love and honor each other and keep the marriage bed undefiled. We're not to steal, but to help our neighbor and to give alms. We're not to lie or gossip, spread harmful or false witness, but build up our neighbor and defend them. We are not to covet what belongs to another or seek to entice those from others, but be content with what God has given us 
and encourage all others to do likewise. Thus, we are always active in good works. There is always enough work to do that we are never idle in God's kingdom. And yes, many of these works seem mundane. They're not flashy, but by virtue of our faith and the Holy Spirit working within us, these are good works which God our Father desires. So let us always remember and have the proper attitude about it, that we do good works not to earn anything, not to merit salvation, not to work our way into the kingdom, but rather because God in his grace has already brought us into the kingdom. We have been saved from the idleness of sin through the work of his Son on the cross, and have been called by the Holy Spirit through the word into his kingdom. Let us then press on, not running aimlessly, but diligently working in the service of him who saved us, that we might not take what is ours and go, but rather enter into the rest he has prepared for his laborers by his grace. May God grant this to us all. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.